Ecology in a words. I've been hanging around on slash x slash green texts for a while now, hearing about the monsters and the big feet and all the other spooky shit in a words. But I have to ask, how does it all fit together? Not in a conspiracy sort of way, mind you, in an ecological sense. What are all of these creatures eating, what do they need to survive? What happens when they meet one another? Are they hunting each other, competing, or what? I'm a wildlife biologist, and I enjoy a good monster story, and I like combining those two interests. So let's go into some theorizing and explaining on how all of these monsters fit into the ecosystems they're from. We'll start simple, crawlers, rakes, whatever the hell you wanna call them. I mean, if these creatures are dimensionally native, I'd imagine they eat typical prey found in the woods. If not, they may consume earthly energies, like emotions, fear, anger. I'm no expert, but it is a fascinating topic. Gonna be honest, I'm not very impressed by these things. Yeah, they're fast, they're carnivores, they look like people, but all things considered, they're absolutely not anywhere near the top of the food chain. Crawlers are creepy, yeah, but they don't really have the muscle mass or the adaptations to take down big game. Deer, moose, boars, these are all animals that weigh hundreds of pounds. For that kind of game, you need more than just a creepy smile and some claws, you need muscle, the lack of which is kind of one of these things defining traits. The mouths are often described as small, not that good for inflicting a big deadly bite, maybe a crawler could get the drop on a deer from above and get a kill, but that's not going to be a reliable source of food. The same goes for just eating people, even if they were consistently chowing down on crackheads and lost kids, there's just not enough people out there to sustain a population of these things. The logical answer is that these things are, well, like us, that is, generalists. They're almost certainly going after smaller meals that they can cram into their mouths or carry off, birds, small mammals, fruit, maybe baby deer and shit. It's all stuff that requires them to move around constantly as they look for enough food to match the calories they're consuming as they chase you guys around, there's similar creatures like that today with shit like cougars and jumping spiders. Larger game isn't out of the question, but if they go for it, it's probably going to be relatively infrequent, and the bodies are likely dragged up into trees or something as food caches, like leopards. Why? Because crawlers aren't alone in the woods, and there's shit that can eat them. Second thing with crawlers, there's a lot of shit that you guys claim is out there that can very easily wreck a crawler's shit. Bigfoot and Dogman stick out particularly to me, but there's also a much more mundane beastie in the woods that can pretty soundly clap a crawler. Bears. I'm sorry, but there is no goddamn way that one of these chicken-legged, rail-thin, 120 pounds tops motherfuckers is going to come out on top against a full-grown bear. These things are solid blocks of muscle, fur, and fuck you, a crawler just can't going to match that. But it's not predation that I'm thinking about with bears, it's competition. Bears are going to be eating the same stuff a crawler's eating, and they're big enough that they can just wait out leaner times with built-up fat deposits. But most importantly, they can handle the cold. A bear's got thick fur and hide, dense muscle, and layers of fat to keep it warm, not to mention being able to just nap through the snow. Crawlers. They don't really have anything to keep from turning into ass naked popsicles, they're going to need to find shelter from the snow, and that's going to put them into further competition with bears. So, how do we solve this problem? The crawlers seem up shit creek without a paddle, until you remember two things. 1. Crawlers are climbers, that means that they can make use of caves much more so than bears. And what do you know? Major hotspots of crawler activity coincide with areas like the Appalachians and the Sierra Nevada mountains, spots where there's tons of caves and tunnels. People go missing in these spots all the time, eaten by the hungry earth, but a crawler could navigate these tunnels easily, feeding on the carrion and keeping itself hidden throughout harsher seasons without worrying about a grizzly rocking its shit. 
Which brings me to the other factor, namely, the fact that we wiped out most of the big predators of North America. And filled the woods with homes for them. Abandoned buildings, crack dens, mine shafts, basements, hunting blinds, garden sheds, we've crammed the goddamn woods full of places where a crawler could hide from the worst of the weather, while simultaneously providing them with more food that they know they can easily access on a regular basis. Pets, chicken coops, garbage dumps, food waste, even shit like fruit orchards and crop fields and the stuff that gets tossed out from there for not being good enough for consumers, it's all stuff that could very easily feed generalist creatures like crawlers, and they're absolutely smart enough to figure that out, especially given that they don't seem afraid of people. What's more, we've also handily wiped out most of their major predators and competitors. Bears and wolves and cougars used to spread from coast to coast, but now they're reduced to just a handful of spots. It's the same process that led to coyotes conquering the continent, and honestly, those animals seem to be a pretty good model for the crawler. They're not unkillable super monsters, they're coyotes that happen to be shaped like people. Admittedly, this is the main bulk of my thinking on this, from here on out, a lot of my notes are going to be a bit less in depth. If you guys have more critters you want me to look over, I'd be happy to. Of course, there's also the question, what the fuck are all of these things eating? That's, a bit complicated. Until relatively recently, North America had an absolute shitload of big prey items and equally big predators, horses, camels, mastodons, mammoths, saber-tooth cats, lions, megacondors, all sorts of shit. Problem is, most of these prehistoric animals would have also been able to wipe the floor with a woods shit, while at the same time preventing a lot of their preferred habitat from taking hold, huge animals cured the forests that they live in, bulldozing young trees and undergrowth. Given that most Ice Age megafauna are gone, and Big Feet and Dogmen aren't, it's a pretty safe bet that they weren't eating these big animals, predators are dependent upon their prey, which makes them particularly vulnerable to extinctions. That's not to say that these megafauna aren't gone, though, there's plenty of megafauna reports from Canada, as well as a critter that you lot have proposed, the Gorp. General consensus is that these things are ground sloths, and honestly, there's a pretty solid argument to be made for it being out there. Ground sloths were incredibly successful, adaptable animals, they got as far north as Alaska and the Yukon, and there's some evidence that they got into Russia. Generalist diets, able to climb, swim, and dig, relatively slow metabolisms, a smaller species would be a perfect candidate to survive the Ice Age extinctions, and the defenses of the group would also make it a hell of a prey item for Inawood's monsters. See, one family of ground sloths had a very interesting little trick up their sleeves, hidden underneath their skin, they had a network of tiny pieces of bone called osteoderms that acted like a set of organic chain mail. We've got some preserved examples of mummified sloth skin from caves in the Andes, and it took a fire axe to successfully cut through it. Add on to that the big, heavy bones that ground sloths were known to have, and you have an animal that's a dead ringer for the bulletproof monsters that LAR purse keep running into. We also know a good deal about ground sloth behavior, and it further builds onto their survival, namely, they were pretty territorial animals, digging out massive burrows into the earth that they returned to to sleep and to shit. Some of the bigger species could make tunnels longer than football fields and wide enough to drive a car through, corps of course aren't making anything that big, but they'd be hiding away in their territories and keeping their shit in one spot where people wouldn't be likely to find it. And those tunnels would in turn make prime habitat for creatures like crawlers and sasquatch, secluded spaces that would have stayed warm in winter and cool in summer hidden away from the world. Eating the gorp itself? Not very likely, besides their claws, strength, and armor, the matted filthy fur would make eating one a poor option, but there's plenty of animals whose shelters are taken over by other creatures, including ground sloth burrows, as it turns out. So gorps probably aren't regular prey items for monsters in a woods, not frequently at least, but they could definitely be a major boon to other cryptids. 
but there's something else that could very easily feed these monsters, brought in by human beings. Pigs. Pigs are, honestly fucking terrifying. They regularly weigh almost half a ton, they'll eat a human without hesitation, and if you let them out into the wild, they very rapidly revert into a near feral state resembling their boar ancestors. What's more, they're incredibly common all across the continent, taking advantage of the abundant food provided by human garbage and the relative lack of large predators that can stop them. Except, of course, for monsters. A Bigfoot could more than easily kill even a bigger pig, while mystery big cats would be right at home gorging on something fairly similar to their natural prey items. Dogmen would be in a similar situation, and crawlers could probably down smaller examples. All of this would in turn start to pressure wild pig populations to grow faster and bulk up more, selecting for pigs that can grow into absolute monsters too big for anybody to tackle. And just like that, we have an explanation for Hogzilla. And hogs aren't the only animals let out onto the continent, either, there's quite a few species of deer, sheep, and antelope that escaped from game ranches and went feral. In Florida, you've got pythons and capybaras, the south in general has nutrias, invasive species taking advantage of the relatively open ecosystem of North America to spread are ending up as food for the monsters in a woods that did the same thing a few thousand years ago. Next up, dogmen. Long story short, I'm pretty sure that these are much more dog than man, bears can already get really uncannily human-like when they rear up, it's not much of a stretch to figure that an animal adapted for rearing up like a meerkat would be able to match the profile of a dogman sort of creature. Funny thing is, there was a group of carnivores that matched that description pretty well, the amphicyanids, or bear dogs. Ultimately, these animals went extinct due to competition with both wolves and bears, animals that weren't as big, but had faster rates of reproductions and more generalist diets that let them monopolize food sources. The ancestor of the dogman was probably an animal that bucked these trends, a generalist that stuck to deep forests and stayed relatively small and adaptable, again, the ice age would have limited the thing's presence even further. Elephants and sloths and mammoths all kept woodland habitats largely open through their endless eating, which in turn means that the dense forests that you see nowadays would have been a lot rarer. With the extinction of those animals, you had a lot less pressure on the woods until the arrival of European loggers, the beasts in a woods were free to expand their ranges, and the dogmen would have been among them. Big and bulky animals, they were largely free to take down moose, wood bison, elk, and of course, other monsters. It's entirely likely the dogmen are part of the reason why Sasquatches aren't as widespread as they are, same with other more supernatural spooks. You see something similar in tigers, who actively hunt wolves and bears in Siberia, likewise, big cats will actively hunt other predators whenever they get the chance. The more emphasis on the dog part of dogmen could also explain how these things have gone undetected, big predators like these don't go unnoticed for long, and we've got centuries of experience looking for signs of bears and wolves. But an animal like a dogman can hide through, well, not hiding at all. Its signs and tracks are found, but they look enough like bear or wolf tracks that people don't see them as anything out of the ordinary, hell, dogmen could also be responsible for various stories of giant wolf monsters, including the Shunka Warrican and other monsters with relatively little description beyond big carnivore that hunt down dogs, just the same as how this hypothetical dogman could have maintained its territories even in the face of canine and ursine competition. Next up, not deer. Honestly, there's already plenty of weird fucked up diseases that affect deer that could pretty handily explain these things, happens when you evolve to flirt by way of domesticated bone cancers, but that's not nearly as fun of an explanation. As such, we'll be treated not deer as they're described, a creature that mimics deer species in order to hunt. First thing to note with this, there's quite a few options for what exactly a not deer is eating. Deer already can and will eat small animals, and mimicking one would allow this predator to go after not only small game that wouldn't be scared off by what looks like a normal deer, but stuff like coyotes, badgers, Hell, with some of the size estimates I've seen with not deer, 
I wouldn't be surprised if they could go after shit like cougars or turkeys. Other deer wouldn't be off the menu, either, a not deer could use its disguise to lure in horny bucks that see them as either mates or as rivals, depending on whether the not deer has antlers grown in at the time. However, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that they might be eating some plant matter as well, forwards facing eyes aren't actually that big of a factor in determining if an animal's a predator, there was a goat with forward facing eyes alive until a few hundred years ago, and crocodiles certainly don't have that kind of eye set up, either. Second note, there's perhaps a distinction to be made about whether or not this is creature that mimics deer specifically, or if it's a general shapeshifter. I know that some stories about crawlers have them be capable of shape-shifting, but what if it's the other way around? Rather than a crawler that can turn into other things, what if's just a shape that's regularly adopted because it's faster and more maneuverable than the base form, while the not deer is used for stealthier movement? Oh shit I never actually talked about devil monkeys, let's fix that. There's actually some precedent for primates in North America, the last native one died out just 30 million years ago, it's entirely possible that some weird fuckers developed that lingered on in the woods, only to expand their range along with the rest of the monsters they live alongside when dense forests started to get more common. I'd even make the argument that they could be behind a number of vaguely similar critters across the continent, giant monkey monsters in Appalachia and Canada aside, there's also the hypothesis that the Goatman's a weird giant monkey. I'd wager that it's entirely possible that crawlers are specimens of devil monkey suffering from mange, but like with not deer, that's not exactly a fun answer. In general, I'd suggest that crawlers and devil monkeys are cousins of some sort, but they actively compete with each other whenever they meet, feeding as they do on the same things. But this begs the question, how have these things stayed hidden while also being super aggressive? Simple, drugs. Primates getting hooked on human intoxicants is a known phenomenon across the world, monkeys developing alcoholism is a problem in both Africa and the Caribbean, and we know for a fact that the drugs that affect humans sure as hell work the same on other primates. Hell, there's even quite a few stories of Sasquatches raiding marijuana crops. For the devil monkeys, a lot of the major interactions that they have with humans are going to be folks trying to do shit in the woods that they don't want anyone knowing about, cults, breakaway communities, moonshine operations, weed farms, and of course meth labs. None of these groups are going to report seeing something like this around whatever weird shit they're doing, and the devil monkeys are not only getting used to people, but associating them with food leading to tweaked out monkey monsters following roads towards towns in their quest for anything that they can stuff into their mouths in the hopes that it might give them their fix. The disturbing thing about crawlers to me actually is that they might have a small, weak bite. If you look at monkeys or chimps who hunt prey, you have to consider that they absolutely suck at it. What this means is that their prey often suffers terribly, just look at what chimps do to monkeys they catch. What this means for any largish prey that a crawler gets a hold of, a deer caught slipping, or a human, is they won't go painlessly. They'd probably be bludgeoned with those long arms, pulled apart or gutted, and have to feel the experience of a lot of ineffectual bites. Not a good way to go. In that respect they're also not too unlike coyotes, so that was a good comparison. Also you have to factor in that wiry lanky primates are often way stronger than they look, and a crawler would be no exception. To be sure, I'd agree they would be generalist feeders and spend a lot of time foraging, hunting small game, or licking scum off of cave walls or whatever. But I wouldn't underestimate one as a threat either. And they're one of those things where the closer they might be to humans, the worse they get. We all know what humans are capable of, you can just imagine what our subhuman cave dwelling cousins might get into. Agreed also that they would be BTFO by bears and likely wolves and cougars. Let alone Bigfoot and Dogman. Mind you, chimps and monkeys do actually have very powerful jaws, and that's reflected in their skulls. A crawler just doesn't have the necessary attachment points, the head is always small and rounded, no sagittal crest or cheekbones to attach powerful jaw muscles. That said, 
even chimps are much bulkier than you'd expect them to be, I admit that I may be underselling the crawler, especially if they could use shit like flint scrapes or rocks, but they just do not have the equipment to really be a consistent threat to a person. But you know what? You're right. Let's talk about Bigfoot, or more specifically, why I think they've started to vanish. First of all, get the fuck out of here with that they're from another dimension bullshit. You don't need black magic or Ouija boards or whatever the fuck for big hairy dudes to live out in the woods. It's not like we're hurting for potential ancestors, my personal theory is that they're either evolved from Paranthropus, a big beefy cousin to Australopithecus that opted for bigger bodies and stronger jaws instead of brain power, or they're an even older branch of the family tree that split off in the Middle East or Eurasia and kept going east. In a way, their migration would have paralleled our own a couple million years later, even as we steadily pushed them out. Stories of ogres, wildmen, giants, it could have all come from our ancestors meeting these fuckers before they pulled further back into spots where they could thrive but we can't. Our ancestors kind of have a history of murder fucking -ing every other human species we meet into extinction or absorption into our gene pool, and I doubt that the wildmen would have been any different, thing is, they'd have the advantage of being able to make a living in spots where craziest motherfucker in the Cro-Magnon tribes wouldn't see it as worth the risk. What's more, the wild men would have absolutely been smart enough to know that, and I know that for a very simple reason. Simply put, there's no way that a big ape could have survived in such close proximity to humanity for so long without being spotted. Gigantopithecus was a giant orangutan cousin that was even bigger than Bigfoot, and that thing died out when it went up against pointy sticks. But a group of people, especially a group of people who've been out in those woods since before the ice ages and who don't want to be found? That's another story entirely. The thing about our ancestors is that, well, we don't really know when they became human, so to speak, and I'm not talking about biologically. Tool use isn't something unique to us, even Paranthropus, the big dumbass I mentioned earlier, have some evidence suggesting that they might have been making complex tools and had figured out efficient ways of butchering big animals. Now fast forward a few million years, with those apes being forced to figure out new ways of finding food, defending themselves, and keeping warm in the nightmare world of the ice ages. When you look at Native American legends about Bigfoot or similar creatures, you get a ton of different interpretations of course, but they tend to have a single common thread, namely, that they're more than just animals. You get giants that make armor by smearing mud and stones onto their skin, baby-eating rape ogres, but you also get stories that boil down to those guys who lived over on the other side of the mountains and smoked a bowl with our ancestors, they just happened to be big and hairy. It's the same sort of spectrum of perspectives you get when one culture is mythologizing another, and when you look at the reports, you see more of the same. One that always sticks with me is this report from the Pacific Northwest where a group of Sasquatch were seen gathering kelp from the beach, not eating it on the spot, but dragging it inland. Kelp's really useful for making things, including medicines, you don't see animals collecting medicine and saving it for later instead of just eating that shit on the spot. A troop of big apes? Yeah, those are going to be spotted soon enough. Apes are smart, but they're apes, they leave nests, they leave tracks, they leave their shit and they're dead. But people? People can learn to sneak around, people can cover their tracks and clean up after they're done doing whatever, people can make camouflage and bury their dead. So, where are these big bastards now? Why are the sightings trailing off now? I think that extinction's finally catching up with them. Humans as a general rule don't tend to play nice with others. When you look at the fossil record, you get a pretty grim picture. Whether it was just slaughtering our own relatives, getting balls deep in enough Neanderthal pussy to absorb their entire species into our genome, or a mix of both, we don't know, but wherever Homo sapiens goes, any other species of human in the same area gets real dead real fast. The ancestral Sasquatch managed to avoid this mainly by living out in environments that even the craziest bastards among the Cro-Magnons wouldn't consider it worth the risk, they found their spots away from us, 
and they got their peace where they could. In North America, they found a balance, they stayed in their spots, and we stayed in ours. But, well, nothing lasts forever. You lot ever read about how absolutely apocalyptic the fall of the Native Americans was? There used to be millions of people living on this continent before the Caucasoids rolled up, empires, cities, countries. The earliest settlers to sail along the east coast wrote of villages so huge that they could smell the smoke of their fires from the decks of their ships days before they got to land, just a few centuries later, all of those settlements are just fucking gone, all wiped out by diseases they had no exposure to. Now, what do you think would happen when those diseases spread to another set of tribes, who've been living isolated out in the woods for centuries and don't have any real way of contacting one another as their members die by the dozens from diseases like nothing they've ever seen before? Apes being vulnerable to human diseases and vice versa is nothing new, we all know about the shit that monkeys can spread to people, but it goes the other way too. In zoos, apes catching diseases from visitors is a serious problem, and it's a threat to modern ape populations too. If Bigfoot's out there, they're not long for this world, we managed to genocide an entire species without even knowing they were there. They hid their dead and buried their brothers, even as their bodies broke down from the inside out under the touch of an enemy that they couldn't even conceive of, much less fight. They pulled back further, hid even deeper, but they ultimately only screwed themselves over more. Isolation leads to inbreeding, which weakened their immune systems even more. I don't think that the bits of Sasquatch culture we know about are communication, wood knocking, hooping, all that. I think their funerary rites, the swan song of a dying species. Goddamn beautiful thread up, I am enjoying it a lot. Here is a thought for you to ponder. Where the hell is the giant mustlid? Every family of animals has its giants, moose, and Irish elk for deer, the bison, berries are almost a canine, cats have the Siberian tiger. So where is the mustlid, because mustlids are by far the strongest and smartest little critters around, the big one has to exist at some point in history or even now. Currently the biggest is the wolverine, which is by no means small in its behavior and strength but it's only the size of a border collie. There has to be a big one out there and it has to be incredibly intelligent and strong. Possible counterpoint, maybe there's no giant mustlid because they're all such vicious little bastards and so strong already that there was no selective pressure for them to get much bigger. Being big can be expensive, and right now they have most of the benefits already with none of the drawbacks. Oh shit wait, otters are mustlids right? Well we have giant otters still today, but there were much bigger ones in the fossil record. Reminds me of those, Water Panther, reports I read about in old cryptozoology books as a kid. Bigfeet and Yetis are probably different species at this point, given how long they've likely been isolated, hell, actual accounts of Yetis, at least, not the old ones that treat them more as mystical beings, describe at least three different species. Yowies, though. There's a much more cursed explanation for them. Back during the Ice Age, there used to be giant kangaroos in Australia, too big to hop, so they walked around like humans. They had short flat faces, long powerful arms, and if they were anything like modern kangaroos, they were absolutely fucking jacked. If I saw one of these bastards in the twilight, only able to see the silhouette? Yeah I'd call it a fucking Bigfoot. There's no crawlers in Australia, though. The drop bears got them all. None of these cryptids are natural. If it looks like a hybrid then it was likely created by the type 2 civilization that we are nested inside of. Most of the monsters and cryptids people see today were created during the war in heaven or cosmic battle for this solar system. The asteroid belt is evidence of the doomsday weaponry used in this war that destroyed an entire planet. The echoes of this trauma find expression in certain fiction i.e. the Death Star from Star Wars. Dogman, not the government lab created Dogman, was one of the demon dogs, hybrid monster, bred by Tiamat, queen of monsters, for war against the Anunnaki in the cosmic battle for this solar system. Same for Bigfoot. In Kiju for example is a Sasquatch. They are both Frankenstein hybrid genetic freak lab experiments mixed with Terran hominid DNA. Dogman and Sasquatch have telepathic ability. 
It is actually more unnatural not to have telepathic ability but ours has been deliberately suppressed by the agents of this simulation slash medicine so we think it is supernatural. Also the rake slash crawlers, tall lanky creatures, are simply the feral devolved human and human hybrid survivors from the previous civilization wiped out by the younger Dryas impact. Most of these survivors spread across the globe and formed new civilizations known to the archaeological record. But some of these survivors got isolated and went underground and devolved into these emaciated feral people. The movie Descent is based on these creatures. Most fiction, even from imagination, is almost always based on something real. Party because of Freemasons controlling what makes it into culture but also because this seems to be how the universe works. When people tell stories they tap into the unconscious slash Akashic archives. Nothing new under the sun and so on. Not sure why it works this way but it do. Anyway, 13,000 years of selection pressure created a divergent species that look like monsters and live underground. People also see these mountain trolls much larger than Bigfoot. Very rare cryptid. 10 to 12 feet tall and much less hominid in appearance. Not sure what those are. Surviving giant ground sloth? Possible but they look closer to some kind of mountain troll. J.R.R. Tolkien was not writing fiction when he created Arda. He was describing the conditions on Earth during the last glacial period before the younger Dryas comet impact. A time when giants and monstrous megafauna roamed Earth. He was writing real history disguised as fiction taken from the secret library at Oxford that only elites had access to. Think Errol Linda but the stuff never released to the public. He was one of the only people who could read and translate some of these ancient Norse and Finnish texts. This is why he claims in interviews that Middle Earth was a real place and his books are not allegory or fiction. Silmarillion describes the war in heaven or the ancient cosmic battle that happened in this solar system. Gnomes slash dwarves are an advanced ultra-terrestrial civilization that occupies parallel interpenetrating dimensions. Same with elves. Then there are the breakaway Germans. Normal humans with field propulsion tech. They live underground and probably escaped into the past. It gets confusing from here because there are also these alleged ET Nordics but my personal theory is that all these humanoid looking extraterrestrials all originate from some meta-civilization that exists 5th dimensionally and seeded life across time and space which is why the apparent aliens look like us. Warp space warp time, UFOs are time machines, therefore UFOs are agents of the simulation slash meta-civilization. Field propulsion research is always suppressed because of these agents. I'll speculate on it a moment, this is a sort of umbrella set of ideas that would apply to all large bipedal creatures operating on the North American continent. First off if they're undetected this long, leave no usual signs such as corpses, poop, dens, etc., then there is some presently unknown variable allowing them to exist undetected, they are not simply well hidden. What this is I haven't seen any real concrete evidence of. Are they from another dimension, outer space, or do they have some way of cloaking themselves at will from modern senses and equipment? Personally I think that these things have to come from somewhere else, their main populations are not here for lack of a better term, and what we are seeing are probably outlier individuals or group that have some reason to be in the Pacific Northwest or whatever, be it food, curiosity, or recreation. Think about what kind of humans you'd find deep in the real forest, Think about if your only experience with humans was observing deer hunters, you'd say they didn't have a sustainable population, you'd have no way of knowing they're not representative of how the mainline human population looks or acts, or even how they themselves act 99% of the time. There's just not enough information. Food source. As stated above I don't think any of them live where they're seen full time, some certainly seem willing and eager to eat a normal big predator's diet including humans, but if they were regularly eating animals or plants here we'd see more signs of them. Intelligence. Without being facetious they're at least smart enough to avoid most humans or human surveillance methods, so they're probably above chimps, but they don't use machines or tools of their own, or even ours that they have access to. The exception being skinwalkers who seem to quickly figure out vehicles and electronics, but are 100% hostile and always provoke life or death situations. Their intent. I suspect this varies wildly by the individual, as I've said I don't think they live here but I have no idea where they might actually live, it could be underground or alternate universes for all I know. 
I don't think enough of them are eating here to make food a primary reason to come, to go with the deer hunter analogy again I think that anything they kill or eat here is a recreational or ceremonial thing that doesn't represent their normal diet or hunting practices. Hostile actors. Skinwalker get special mention because they're the only ones in the stories that specifically seem to go into direct confrontation with humans, although there are scattered stories of Bigfoots or dogmen chasing people. I think this is rare because, whatever they're here for, it's not us, and they'd rather we not be involved at all, hence why most of them just try to chase humans away. Skinwalkers probably need us for reproduction or cultural reasons or something, because if you had the option of eating anything humans are a poor choice of prey, like even polar bears rarely survive a real attempt to kill humans, shape-shifting is an edge but not enough of one to make humans a viable long-term food source. It's likely that even in these scariest of Inawood's creatures, human prey is a rarity. Skinwalkers probably need us for reproduction or cultural reasons or something, because if you had the option of eating anything humans are a poor choice of prey, like even polar bears rarely survive a real attempt to kill humans, shapeshifting is an edge but not enough of one to make humans a viable long-term food source. I don't know, I can agree with a lot of this thread but skinwalkers to me seem, if they're real of course, like something that has evolved to prey on humans specifically. Their rarity would speak to the fact that this is not an easy or safe lifestyle, sure, but not that it's impossible. Over-specialized predators being rare and vulnerable to extinction at any moment is nothing new after all. Basically, I would think skinwalkers are to humans what these not deer would be to deer, if indeed they're not actually the same thing. Also, it may or may not tie into skinwalkers directly but to me the human aversion to uncanny valley, faces or movements implies to me that there is, or at least was, some human mimic predator out there, very possibly another hominiod of some sort. The usual explanation that it's some sort of aversion to corpses doesn't track for me. Corpses do not move around jerkily or have eyes spaced slightly wrong, for example. 